Well, good morning. It truly is an honor for me to uh, be here in Nashville, a, uh, a city that I have a lot of uh, respect for. Um, I get up here a couple of times a year, and uh, I'm just amazed at uh, how this city is, is, is growing and, and really flourishing. And this morning, I want to share with you a message that I think, um, I really don't think there's any more important message that I could bring to you uh, this morning that I'm going to, to share with you. Uh, and it has to do with <clears throat> what I call life's greatest paradox. And that paradox is simply this, that strength is found in humility. That strength is found in humility. And I want to introduce this message through the words of uh, an author that some of you may be familiar with, uh, Donald Miller. He wrote the best-selling book, Blue Like Jazz, and he has a very unusual perspective uh, on life. And he, uh, he, for years, says, I wondered <clears throat> what would happen if some alien came to our country and observed our lives and observed our lifestyles and the way we lived. And then he had to go back to his planet and report to a supervisor <clears throat> and share what he had observed and what he had learned about us. And he had these thoughts running through his mind over the, over the months. And he said, I woke up in the middle of the night and felt inspired. And I sat down and I penned these words. And so what I'm going to share with you, these are words from the alien's point of view, and this is what he wrote. <clears throat> Humans as a species are constantly and in every way comparing themselves to one another, which given the brief nature of their existence seems an oddity, and for that matter, a waste. Nevertheless, this is the driving influence behind every human's social development and emotional health and sense of joy, and sadly, their greatest tragedies. It's as though something that helped them function and live well has gone missing in their lives. And they're pining for that missing thing in all sorts of odd methods, none of which are working. The greater tragedy is that very few people understand that they have this disease. This seems strange as well because it's very obvious in their lives. To be sure it's killing them and yet sustaining their social and economic systems. They are an entirely beautiful people with a terrible problem. You know, I think he's right. You know, I think the human condition is very difficult for us to understand. And Miller says, if that alien could come and stand here this morning and speak to all of us, this is what he would say to us. Why are you so obsessed? You have to wear a certain kind of clothes, drive a certain car, speak a certain way, live in a certain neighborhood, whatever. All of it so you can be higher on this invisible hierarchy. It's an obsession. You're trying to feel right by comparing yourself to others. It's ridiculous. Who told you there was anything wrong with you in the first place? And I'd like to go back to one phrase that this alien said to his supervisor. He says, very few people understand they have this disease, and yet it's so obvious in their lives. What is this disease that he makes reference to? Well, it's what the Bible calls the pride of life. It's an arrogance. It's having too high a view of yourself. C.S. Lewis says it's the greatest of all sins. Now, whenever I talk about pride, people get a little confused because they, they realize there's also, there's a positive side to pride because there's two definitions. 
The first definition is, is positive. It has to do with uh, striving for excellence, being the very best you can be, to take pride in, your, in the quality of, of your work. And that's a good. But the pride that the Bible speaks of, the pride that I'm speaking of to you this morning, is an arrogance. It's this feeling of superiority that we have over others. And C.S. Lewis makes three very significant observations about pride. And I would ask you to listen to this first one because it's got a wow factor to it. He says, pride has been the chief cause of misery in every nation and in every family since the beginning of time. I mean, the chief cause of misery. He says it's like a spiritual cancer that eats up your soul. But he says the thing that makes it so deadly in each of our lives is that we're not aware of its existence in our lives. He says, you know, we can see it in other people very easily. And he says when we see it, we hate it when we see it. The problem is, he says, that same pride that we see in others, we're blind to it in our own lives. And you know, the area of our lives where I think it might could be most destructive is in our business lives, out in the business world. Let me give you three examples. Several years ago in the Harvard Business Review, they cited a study that they had done on why leaders fail. And in this study, they looked at four primary factors that they felt like bring great leaders down. The first was because they're authoritarian. They're controlling, demanding, don't listen to other people. They're autonomous. They don't listen. They don't, they're not accountable to anybody else. They're aloof. They're isolated. Third, he says, so often they fail because they commit adultery. But fourth, and probably most significant, he says, they became, the, the study said they became more and more arrogant as time went by. And I think the underlying reason that these leaders encountered failure can be summed up by these words straight from the study, feeling and acting as if they were superior to all others. A second example I'm sure most of you are familiar. I bet a number of you have read Jim Collins' best-selling book, Good to Great. What so many people don't realize is eight years later, he and his team of researchers came together and began to study and try to understand the decline and fall of once great companies. And he wrote a book called How the Mighty Fall. And he said they came up with this model in studying all of these companies that once had been great and mighty companies and eventually went bankrupt. And he said they went through five stages. And the first stage, he says, was arrogance. Listen to this as I read from Collins' own words. Listen to this and think about it. How might it apply to you and your company? He says people come to regard their company's success as an entitlement. And they lose sight of the true underlying factors that led to the company's success in the first place. They do not seek to continually improve their organization, but take the attitude, we will continue to keep things just the way they are and will continue to be successful because we are such a great company. A final example comes from a book that I've been reading It's titled, The Enemies of Excellence. And the subtitle is, Seven Reasons Why We Sabotage Success. The first reason, you guessed it, arrogance. Having too big of an ego. You see, our pride explains so much of what's going on in our lives even though we don't fully understand it. The pride of life explains why we have so many dysfunctions in our lives. 
for instance, explains why we're always worrying about what other people think about us. It explains conspicuous consumption. I mean, think about when you buy something. Wisdom would say you buy something for its usefulness. But our pride calls us to purchase things because of the way it makes us look, particularly something that might be expensive because that means I'm successful. It explains why we're always comparing ourselves to each other. It explains why we compare our children with other people's children. And one of the things that I've learned in the work that I do with men, our pride has a particular negative impact on our ability to have meaningful relationships with other men. You know, women are much more transparent than men are. We don't want to share with anyone our struggles, our weakness, and most significantly our great fears because we have this thought, real men aren't supposed to be afraid. Our pride explains why we have this incredible fear of failure. You know, the fear of failure, the idea of failing is like a psychological death in the eyes of most people, particularly in the business world. And what happens when you do encounter failure? Like maybe some of us did back in 2008 and 2009. It creates this incredible amount of shame in our lives because we think I'm a loser, I'm a failure which leads to depression, and unfortunately, because I, I saw this, I've seen this with three people in my own life, to suicide. My life's just not worth anything. Let me show you how pride really warps us. I'll ask you to be honest with yourself when I share this. Have you ever had someone in your life that experiences something really good, maybe a, a big promotion, Maybe they land a big deal, and you tell them how happy you are from, for them. But in reality, you're not. In reality, you hate it. Because though it's something good for them, it's not good for you. Conversely, how often has it happened that you learn someone in your life experiences pain or hardship or failure? And you tell them how sorry you are. Yet underneath there's this kind of, there's this glee that you're happy that it happened. Do you see what pride can do to you? Do you see why C.S. Lewis calls it the greatest of all sins? The chief cause of misery over the course of, a, of, the course of human history? Now, you may be wondering, why, this is not good news that I'm sharing with you. This isn't something that makes you feel good. But I'm sharing it with you really to drive home the significance of humility and its power in your life. But to take this one step further, there's a real dark side to pride. Think about what pride does to us as parents. Sociologist Anthony Campolo says, we will never know how many children have had their lives made miserable by being pushed to achievements which make their parents look good. Children who are driven to psychological exhaustion for academic achievement often know that their labor is primarily to enhance the status of their parents. Behind the claims that the parents expect the children to do well because success in school will increase their options is the ugly reality that the achievements of the children visibly demonstrate the superiority of the parents. And he says this is, can ruin a child's life. But one that really has, has gotten my attention as we think about a nation in the last couple of months, I, uh, I had the opportunity to watch the documentary of 
that Ken Burns did on the Vietnam War. I'm curious, has anybody seen that, the, that, that documentary? I saw another documentary on the Pentagon Papers, and then the, the movie that just came out, The Post, is also about the Pentagon Papers. And, you know, I, I think that we got into the war in Vietnam for good reasons. But as time went by, our leaders began to realize that we could not win this war unless we go all out and put millions of people over there. They realized it wasn't winnable. They realized that we should pull out. And yet 85% of our military leaders did not want to pull the plug. They did not want to pull out of Vietnam. And the reason he said, they said, it's too humiliating. It'll make us look like we lost the war. President Lyndon Johnson said, I don't want to pull out of Vietnam because it would not make me look very manly. And then Richard Nixon said, we will not pull out of Vietnam because I don't want to be the first U.S. president to lose a war. Now think about this. Think of all of the young men whose lives were lost because of the pride of their leaders. And I share this because I think we can see what pride does to the individual. But look what it can do to a nation. And this is why the Bible says God hates pride. It's an abomination in his sight. He says, I am opposed to the proud. And I think the reason is because he sees what it does to us. And so the real question is, what do we do about the pride of life? I think the answer is very simple. To seek a life of humility. And you may think, so what is that? I think we have a false understanding of what the humble look like. I think sometimes we think humble people are people you can kick around. But really, humility is a form of wisdom. It's thinking clearly. It's thinking realistically. And it starts by recognizing that we are weak, that we are sinful, and that our earthly lives are temporal and passing away. And they are, which should cause us to see our great need for God himself. And I think this is really where humility begins. It's living with a sense of dependence upon him. And yet, at the heart of humility, it's knowing who really deserves the credit and the glory for what we do. In the Old Testament, Moses tells us what arrogance really looks like. He says, when you look at your life, your abilities, your achievements, and think in your heart, my strength my abilities and my power has led to success in life, he says, that's where arrogance really begins. You may have heard that statement. It's like he was born on third base, but somehow thinks he hit a triple. This is what, this is what pride is. And humility helps us recognize that all that you are and that all that you have is a gift from God and from everybody else that's contributed to your life over the course of time. There's a great story that I want to read to you that uh, I think really kind of pulls all of this together. It's very powerful. I want you to listen to it. It's, it's from a book by Stephen Scott. And he says, my former church pastor, Dr. Jim Barrer, while visiting a church in the Northwest, was asked by a woman to meet with her husband. He was a multi-millionaire entrepreneur with thousands of employees. And although this man had tens of millions of dollars and everything money could buy, he was unhappy, he was bitter and cantankerous, no one liked being around him, and contention and strife followed him wherever he went. He was disliked by his employees and even his children, and his wife could barely tolerate him. When he went with, met with the man, Dr. Barrow listened to him talk about his accomplishments and quickly realized that pride ruled this man's heart and mind. He claimed he had single-handedly built his company from scratch. Even his parents hadn't given him a dime. 
He worked his way through college. Jim said, so you did everything yourself? Yep, the man replied. Jim repeated, you mean no one ever gave you anything? Nothing, the man said. So Jim asked him, so who changed your diapers? Who fed you as a baby? Who taught you how to read and write? Who gave you your first job after college? Who serves food in your company's cafeteria? Who cleans the toilets in your company's restrooms? The man hung his head in shame. Moments later, with tears in his eyes, he said, well, now that I think about it, I haven't accomplished anything by myself. Without the kindness and efforts of others, I probably wouldn't have a thing. Jim nodded and asked, well, don't you think they deserve a little credit and some thanks from you? He said that man's heart was transformed seemingly overnight. In the months that followed, he wrote thank you letters to every person he could think of who'd made a contribution to his life. He wrote thank you notes to every one of his 3,000 employees. He not only felt a deep sense of gratitude, he began to treat everyone around him with respect and appreciation. When Dr. Barrow visited this man a year or two later, he could hardly recognize him. Happiness and peace had replaced the anger and the contention in his heart. He looked years younger. His employees loved him for treating them with the honor and respect that true humility engenders. You know, in this story, you can see what pride does to a person's life and to a person's relationships. He brought misery into everybody's life. And he was disliked by everyone. And most significantly, he took all the credit for everything good that happened in that company. And this is what's so significant is he had no awareness of it. He was clueless of the pride that ruled his heart. But then after he was confronted, you see this major transformation take place in his life. Please notice, this not only impacted his relationships, (coughs) it changed him. It changed him. You see, there's power in humility. Which leads to the big question, how does a a person become humble? You see, pride comes so natural to us, and humility does not. You can't just flip a switch and say, tomorrow I'm going to start being humble. You see, one of the most important truths that I've learned is that we are responsible for seeking a life of humility. We are responsible for cultivating a humble heart. Please hear this. Humility is a choice that you first have to make and then pursue. There's a key phrase that you find in both the Old and New Testaments. It's the phrase, humble yourselves. Humble yourself. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of of God. And you may think, well, how does that happen? What does that really mean? Well, as Dave mentioned there, what I'm sharing with you today is in a book. It's called The Power of a Humble Life. And someone or some people have been generous enough to underwrite the cost of the book so that every single one of you can have a copy. They're piled up on the center of your tables, and I hope you'll take a copy when you leave. But in the book, I lay out four ways that we can humble ourselves. And this is something you can truly apply to your life. And I promise you, if you will put this into practice, it will impact you. It'll change you. 
And because our time is limited, I'm only going to briefly mention one of them. The one thing that I think is most important. You know, earlier I said that humility begins with understanding who deserves the credit and the glory for what we do. For what we have. For what we accomplish. And then when I read that story to you about the the man with the big company who everybody hated and disliked. He realized how arrogant he was. He gave nobody else credit. And so what did he do? He began to thank every person who had contributed to his life. He wrote thank you notes to all 3,000 of his employees. Gratitude. You know what? Gratitude is like humility. It doesn't come natural to us. You have to cultivate a thankful heart. Henry Nouwen says gratitude has to be lived as a discipline. And so every day, I spend 10 minutes or so giving thanks to God for my life, for my health, for my wife and children, for the relationships he's blessed me with, for the talents, the gifts, the abilities, the work, the resources, and then all the spiritual blessings of life. And you know what? I can tell you this. It's changed me. It's changed the way I see life. It's caused me to see the good hand of God in my life as I go through each day. Dr. Han Selyu, a great, I believe he was a sociologist, he was the, 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 the first real pioneer in discovering the impact of our emotions on our physical and mental health. He wrote 30 books on the subject. And towards the end of his life, he realized he had put out so much information, he said, I need to summarize all of my research. And he said, the most damaging emotion to our health, not surprisingly, is anger and bitterness and seeking revenge. He says it does unbelievable damage to your health. But this is what's interesting. He said that it's a heart of gratitude is most nourishing to a person's health. You see, thanksgiving is life-giving. It's transformative. It's like therapy for a person's soul. And I believe it's where the, the path of humility really begins. Now, I want to close our time together by sharing a great insight really into everything that I've said this morning. There was a book that came out, I think it was back in the 1990s, that many consider one of the the, the greatest books written in the last 50 years. It's called The Denial of Death, written by Ernest Becker, who was an anthropologist. They won a Pulitzer Prize. And in the book... He says that we all have this need for cosmic significance, that our lives really matter. He says that whatever we look to, to get this cosmic significance, he says it becomes our deity in life. He says it's what we end up building our lives and identity around. And for most of us, that cosmic significance we get from our work and being successful at what we do. In the Bible, there's a word that is used often that's pertinent to all of this, and it's the word glory. The word glory means weightiness. It means being substantive. It's about being important. It's the idea of mattering. And Dr. Tim Keller says that every single one of us is starved for glory because we have this deep sense in our souls 
that our lives don't really matter. He says the worst thing that can happen to a person is not to be disliked, is not to be vilified. He says it's to be ignored, to feel like you're just insignificant, to feel like you're just inconsequential. And he says this is why we yearn for glory in this world. As business people, this is why we yearn for glory out in the world as we do our our jobs, as we build our careers. And this is why so many of us have an instability in our hearts. And this is why we're constantly looking for ways to impress other people and convince to the world that I really matter. There's a fascinating article, it's really an interview in Vanity Fair magazine that came out several years ago, and the interview is with Madonna, and Madonna really has a pretty good understanding, I think, of herself. Listen to what she says. These are her words. I have an iron will, and all of my will has always been to conquer some horrible feeling of inadequacy that I had. I push, my, I push past one spell of it and discover myself as being a special human being, that I matter. And then I get to another stage and think I'm mediocre and uninteresting, inconsequential. Again and again, this happens. She says, my life, my drive in life is from this horrible fear of being mediocre. And that's always pushing me pushing me, because even though I've become somebody, my life matters. I still have to prove that I'm somebody every single day. My struggle has never ended, and it probably never will. Think about what she just said. Her fear is being mediocre. Her fear is being that my life does not really matter. And I think that's the ultimate fear of every human being, is that I'm a nobody, that my life really doesn't matter. And even though I have all this success today, I may be a nobody tomorrow. You see, every single one of us has this audience out there, and this audience is usually our community. And we allow this audience to establish our identities. We let this audience validate our lives. And this reveals the heart of our problems. Listen, listen closely to what I say. This is the heart of our problem. We're seeking to impress the wrong audience. Please hear this. We, every single one of us, we were designed to live our lives so that the audience we seek to please first is Christ himself. This is the way we're designed. And when we live our lives in harmony with God's design, that's when we flourish. So I ask you to think about this as we wrap this up. When it gets right down to it, and I ask you to be honest with yourself. When we get right down to it, whose opinion of your life matters most? Think about that. And when your life comes to an end, and it will, Whose opinion will have mattered the most? The prophet Isaiah asks a very penetrating question. He says, why do you have such high regard for man whose breath is in his nostrils? Why do you esteem him so highly? You know what I think? I think 
Isaiah finds it to be quite astonishing that we allow human opinion of us to be so much more important than the holy, infinite God. And so please hear this. Humility flows powerfully into our lives when God becomes the audience that we seek to perform for. Because that's when you'll find that you're no longer controlled by the opinions of others. Think about what that would mean to your life. That you're no longer controlled by the opinion of of others. You see, when this happens, that's when you're truly free. That's when you're truly free to be the person that you were meant to be. There truly is power in the humble life. Let me close this in prayer. Lord, thank you for this time together. I'm grateful for every person here. Lord, I pray that you would use this message in each of our lives. Help us to realize that there is power in the humble life and that we would seek to pursue a life of humility. We thank you and pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Y'all been a terrific audience. Thank you very much for having me.